So you know that there is that uh, concept of dual AV nodal physiology. Conduction through the AV node can proceed via two directions, the physiologic one being the fast pathway, and there is also that other one, maybe I can keep the arrow here, there's also that other one that connects more towards the inferior septum or posterior septum as it's sometimes called, which is the slow pathway. We all have a fast and a slow pathway. So having dual AV nodal physiology is no exception. It's the rule. It's just that you do not always see it in an EP study because often your patient is awake on the table, has a heightened adrenergic tone, and you may not be able to see the slow pathway. But if you do your, in your procedures, for instance, under general anesthesia, you will see that more than 90 to 95% of the people have evidence for dual AV nodal physiology. So that is, is not so special. That AV nodal physiology also corresponds to some uh, anatomical uh, evidence, and I will not go into the details, but anatomists looking very closely at the AV node and the so-called approaches have seen that indeed along the tricuspid valve there is extensions of the AV node, we call them also approaches of the AV node, that somehow form the histological basis of what we have as concepts of uh, slow pathway conduction. You know that in the beginning of an EP study, you do some extra stimulus testing, like here you have a base strain of, for instance, 600 uh, milliseconds, and then you introduce an extra stimulus, and you will gradually decrease the um, coupling interval of this extra stimulus. And you will look at the AH interval, and in my tracings, there will be very small amplitude tracings, so the, his bundle deflections will be small. Um, and here you see the atrial deflection on the his bundle recordings. You record here the his bundle, and you have an AH of 180 milliseconds. And I think all of you will agree this is conduction over the fast pathway. Now we move from 570 to 560, only 10 milliseconds in decrement, and we jump here to an AH interval of 240 milliseconds. And that's the official definition of the jump from the fast pathway to the slow pathway. If you have a more than 50 millisecond increase in the AH interval with a 10 millisecond decrease in the coupling interval of your uh, extra stimulus. Now, if you look at huge numbers of people, then you will see that the longest AH interval that you usually see over the fast pathway is about 220 milliseconds. So sometimes there is not that clear jump of 50 milliseconds or more, and then probably your fast pathway conduction goes into a slow pathway conduction as soon as you have AH intervals over 220 milliseconds. That is not a golden rule, but it's very close. And often you have to use that number uh, to discuss or to find out where you go from fast pathway to slow pathway. So the fast pathway blocks, we conduct slowly over the slow pathway, and if we further decrement the coupling interval, here we already went down to 370 milliseconds, you have that gradual prolonged beat after beat of the AH interval. And here you see we already went to an AH interval of 380 milliseconds, uh, clearly slow pathway conduction. And now we move from 370 to 360. We have an extra stimulus which is captured. We have atrial electrograms, but we have no conduction anymore. So this is the refractory period of the slow pathway. So we have defined by this extra stimulus technique the refractory period of the fast pathway, which was 560 milliseconds, and we have the refractory period of the slow pathway, 360 milliseconds. That's normal evaluation of this dual AV nodal conduction, at least anti-gradely. Now, as you know, sometimes you see that during the conduction over the slow pathway, like here with an AH interval of 440 milliseconds, you also see something happening, namely some atrial activity occurs at the end, which is what we call an AV nodal echo beat. So we have conduction over the slow pathway, but we do not only conduct to the ventricles over the his bundle, we also conduct back now to the atrium over the fast pathway. And of course, this depends on the delay over the slow pathway because the fast pathway, which was blocked anti has to recover 
from that earlier activation so that it is able to conduct retrogradely. And also the atrium, of course, has to recover from the previous beat and need to be excitable again. And only then you will see this echo beat. Again, single echo beats are almost normal physiology. You will see it in everybody. So never make a diagnosis of this patient as AV nodal orientant tachycardia because you see a single echo beat or because you have evidence for dual AV nodal physiology because that is normal physiology. That doesn't distinguish an AVNRT patient from a normal patient. What is particular, however, in a patient with AV nodal orientant tachycardia is that that slow pathway is able to conduct beat after beat after beat after beat. This is what we call one-to-one -one conduction over the slow pathway. And that is not so normal physiology because most of us, if we jump on the slow pathway and we have a second beat and a third beat, the AH interval will prolong and after a couple of beats, it will block. That is what we see on the ECG. That is Wenckebach behavior. That is what most of us have. But some people have slow pathways that can support conduction beat after beat. And you can test that in the EP lab. You can do incremental atrial pacing. So you start pacing at 800 milliseconds, gradually come down. Here we come at 360 milliseconds, have an AH interval of 170, 180. It jumps to 250. Here the fast pathway blocks. We go to the slow pathway. And then we stay on the slow pathway in the next beats. Here we have one-to-one -one conduction. If we continue the next screen, it would just stay like that. That is one of the conditions you need to develop AV nodal orientant tachycardia. Because if the slow pathway cannot conduct one-to-one -one integrally, it will never support AV nodal orientant tachycardia. Because during AV nodal orientant tachycardia, which is here induced at the end of such a stimulus uh, train, you have, of course, also one-to-one -one conduction down the slow pathway and one-to-one -one conduction back to the atrium. That is what distinguishes somebody who has AV node orient and tachycardia. That's something you have to evaluate by incremental atrial pacing. So now we have one to one conduction down the slow pathway, back over the fast pathway, for instance, and then it via the atrium it returns and you have your reentrant loop closed and we have AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, which is the typical form we call this slow, fast AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, as you all know. In this case, of course, atrial activation, because it's coming back over the fast pathway, is appearing in the anterior superior septum, because you have fast pathway <laughs> conduction. Now, you know that there is also uncommon forms of AVNRT, where you have, apart from the slow fast, conduction in the other direction, fast and slow back to the atrium. Here, you, earlier atrial activation will be in the inferior septum, close to the coronary sinus ostium. There's also something which we call slow-slow, where you have two slow pathways, one conducting anterograde, one conducting retrograde. Again, earliest activation here is occurring in the inferior septum. So what distinguishes a typical slow fast from an atypical one is the site of earliest atrial activation, and we will come back to that. We will come back to that, not just the timing, as you will see. So if we have an AVNRT patient and you induce AVNRT, and yesterday you certainly have heard about extra stimuli you can introduce also to rule out an accessory pathway. When you define AVNRT, you also have to define the subtype. And the subtype definition, finding out is it slow, fast, fast, slow, 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 depends on a couple of evaluations. It doesn't take you much time, but you have to do it. What is the pathway used for integrate conduction? What is the pathway used for retrograde conduction? And so we will have to map the earliest atrial activation. We will also look at the lower common pathway. Is there a lower common pathway or not? And I will show you that this is a very helpful discriminator. And maybe, and I will not go into detail in this lecture, other evidence for a lower common pathway. Let's just work ourselves through one case here, one case. It's a female school teacher, 33 years old, with a typical story, palpitations is a couple of years, structurally normal heart. She has gotten a lot of drugs like beta blockers, calcium antagonists, even flecainide, and finally was 
is referred for ablation. Now, just one slide about the guidelines. You may say flakinite, was that a good choice for AVNRT? Uh, well, according to the guidelines, if AVNRT is unresponsive to beta blocker or calcium channel blockers and the patient is not desiring RF ablation, flakinite is an option. It sounds strange, but flakinite will interfere with the fast pathway conduction and in some patients uh, may even be helpful in patients with AVNRT. I don't say it would be my choice, but if the patient does not like an ablation, this might be an alternative if you still have recurrences. Just to, to show you that there is these guidelines from 2003, I think you've gotten the uh, pocket version of it. Um, not so much has changed. I think they're still valid uh, also for the other things. You can look at them if you want. Okay, so we have this school teacher. I will not go too far into the details that this was AVNRT. Here we have incremental pacing. We jump from 108. 90 milliseconds to 380, a clear jump. Now during incremental atrial pacing, again more than 50 millisecond jump is a clear indication of fast to slow. Notice again we are below the 220 milliseconds, which is not a magical number, but a helpful number if you want to use it. She goes into one con one conduction over the slow pathway. That was a prerequisite, as we know. And if we stopped pacing, that tachycardia continued. And here we see the tachycardia, which is not very fast, 480 millisecond cycle length. Here you see the his bundle activation. Here you have retrograde atrial activation. And indeed, we start the tachycardia and we introduce an extra stimulus. We like to introduce the extra stimulus always from the distal his bundle electrode because it's very close to the AV uh, valves. And if you do not capture the his bundle there, as you can see here, you can even pull in the ventricular activation and still preserve and degrade his bundle activation. So we definitely have not captured the his bundle activation here. I, I hope you agree. Nevertheless, we do not change the atrial activation timing. So you all agree with me that we can rule out an accessory pathway here because we have no resetting of the tachycardia, although we have reset the ventricular activation by a fair amount. Okay, So that's simple electrophysiology. We'll not go too much into detail. Now the second important thing why you should use those extra stimulus testing is that you have to find out where is the earliest atrial activation. And usually you can never tell because atrium and ventricle will overlap, especially at the his bundle recordings where you hope to see atrial activation. So the way to do it is to pull in the ventricular activation and then atrial activation, if you do not change it at least, like in this case, atrial activation becomes much clearer. And now you will see that, in fact, we are not able to see any atrial electrograms on the his bundle electrodes because the catheter probably is sitting a little bit too far into the ventricle. So what you should do now is take your moving catheter, your moving catheter, the ablation catheter, and move it in a second time to the anteroseptum to confirm for yourself that atrial activation is early or late in the anteroseptum, because you need to know where is the earliest atrial activation, remember? To know what is the site of earliest activation tells you what is the retrograde conduction. So the earliest A here, I don't know yet. So a question for you. You've seen this so far. Our school teacher, she has AVNRT. We have confirmed that it is AVNRT. I think you agree. What would be your option now? Is this slow, fast, slow, slow, fast, slow? Is this an indeterminate form or do you need more information? So let me go back to this tracing. Uh, I cannot go back to the tracing. Here we have the tracing. And can we have a voting slide? And so then you should be able to vote and which Subform, do you think we have induced in this lady? AH interval was very long, HA interval was short. And so maybe we can close the vote because we don't have much time. And most of you say slow, fast, some slow, slow, some fast, slow, fast, slow, definitely not because we jumped onto the slow pathway before we induced tachycardia. During tachycardia, we had a very long AH interval. This definitely cannot be fast, slow tachycardia. But I would agree with number five. We need more information because as I told you, we didn't see yet where was the earliest atrial activation. We don't know what's happening in the anterior septum. 
So we need more information. Yes. To know the pathway used for retrograde conduction, is this slow, slow, or is this slow, fast, we need to map. We need to know where is the earliest atrial activation. So we had an AH of 440 milliseconds. We had the short HA, but that does not prove by itself that this is slow, fast AVNRT, how strange it may sound. So we need to map the pathway, and we will not vote here. We need to know what is the fast path, what is the slow pathway. Let me show you this case. It's another patient because, unfortunately, I didn't retain the, the, the tracings from this school teacher. But this is another one. You see, very similar. Tachycardia, long A, H interval, short H, A. At least we have A here, but I don't know where the A is there. Same sort of AVNRT. Here, those that have voted this is slow, fast, will say this is slow, fast AVNRT, right? Well, we need to know where is the earliest A. So we introduce again an extra stimulus here. We pull the V. We don't change the timing of the His. The His bundle is still there. But now we reveal the atrial activation sequence. Now we nicely see the atrial activation there in the His bundle recordings. We couldn't figure out what was the atrial activation there. But now we move the ventricular activation, atrial activation is there. Where is earliest atrial activation during this tachycardia? Is it in the anteroceptum? No, it's not. It's here. It's in the proximal coronary sinus. So is this slow, fast avian RT? No, it's not, because the fast pathway conducts in the anterior septum, then this should be first. What we see first is the posterior septum. So this must be conduction retrogradely over a slow pathway. So it's the mapping that tells you what is the retrograde conduction, not the timing. You will say, well, this is bizarre. This is a long AH and short HA. Why is this not slow fast? Well, I tell you because the mapping is there. Now, why may this confuse you? Because that is the result of the lower common pathway, and that's the third element I indicated to you. Let's think a little bit about what is the lower common pathway. Well, the classical concept, we have slow and fast pathway, that before they connect to the His bundle, there is something in between which is called the lower common pathway. If you even look at the books of the 80s, you will see this concept already there. And originally, the idea was that every AV nodal reentrant tachycardia has a lower common pathway. There is some distance between what we call the lower turnaround point and the His bundle. Now, how can you know that there is a lower common pathway? It's not that difficult. And you have to think this through. But you can measure the HA interval during pacing in the ventricle. And you compare it to the HA interval during tachycardia. Now, if you have a lower common pathway, during pacing, the timing from the His bundle to the atrium will be the sum of the conduction over the lower common pathway and over the retrograde conducting pathway whatever that may be. During tachycardia, it will be the difference. Because while you're conducting back to the atrium, you're also conducting to the His. So the HA interval will be artificially short because you have conduction down the lower common pathway simultaneously with conduction back to the atrium. You have to think this through tonight, um, if maybe if you don't catch it now. It's very simple. So we have to compare the HA interval during pacing and the HA interval during tachycardia at the same cycle length. That's what we do here. We have tachycardia here, the right side, H interval here. I tell you this is the A because here we have extra stimuli, for instance, and we can know this is the atrial activation. You can measure the HA interval in anterior septum, 65 milliseconds. By the way, you measure this during tachycardia from the beginning of the His bundle deflection to the beginning of the atrial deflection. Here we have pacing at exactly the same cycle length as the tachycardia. And you see here HA measured from the end of the His bundle, the most proximal His bundle deflection, to the beginning of the same atrial deflection is again 65 milliseconds. It's the same. The difference between HAP and HAT, this should be a delta. That's a, a Windows error here. Um, this was made on a Mac. Um, but the difference is zero milliseconds. Zero milliseconds because means there is no lower common pathway. And how strange it may sound, in contrast to the textbooks of, the, of date, 
typical AVNRT has no lower common pathway. The turnaround point between slow pathway and fast pathway is exactly there where it connects to the His bundle. So if you cannot measure a lower common pathway, then it is fast, slow fast tachycardia. Here you have another example. Tachycardia now with the left side. Look, short HA interval, only 55 milliseconds. If you do the pacing, the his bundle is here, it's very small, but it's there. You can better see it there. HA interval during pacing now is longer, 90 milliseconds. The difference, 35 milliseconds. Here we have a lower common pathway. There is a difference when we measure these HA intervals. And look at where the earlier atrial activation is. It's in the inferior septum, the proximal coronary sinus. This was the example I've just given to you. So patients with atypical AVNRT very often have a lower common pathway, almost always. So can, you can use the presence or the absence of a lower common pathway as a simple way in helping you out to distinguish is this typical or is this atypical AVNRT. So in our school teacher, I can show you the tracings. The delta HA was zero. She had no lower common pathway. We also mapped the earliest atrial activation in the anterior septum, but you have to map it. Only then you can say this was indeed typical slow fast AVNRT. But you needed more information. Those that voted it was slow fast were right, but it was a guess. So, typical slow fast, if you want to look at all the criteria, this is from a publication I made together with Sonny Jackman. AH interval is long, it's over the slow pathway. You have anteroceptal exit, you have to map there, and you have a HA difference, which is <laughs> minus one plus minus seven milliseconds. It's less than 10 milliseconds, that's what it should say. And you have no lower common pathway except in very few situations. 77% of AVNRT patients have typical slow, fast AVNRT. 11% will have slow, slow. Earliest exit will be postoceptally, and they will have a lower common pathway in 85%. Fast, slow, earliest activation in the post septum, short AH interval, less than 220 milliseconds, even less than 200, and always a lower common pathway. You see? If you use these three criteria, earliest A, timing of the AH, and the lower common pathway evaluation, you can easily distinguish avian RTs. Well, easily, there is some exceptions. You have some cases where you have evidence for one and the other, so it's conflicting evidence, then we call it undetermined or undeterminate AVNRT. So try to distinguish these subforms. It doesn't take much time, and it makes your procedures much more fun, because you know much better what you're dealing with. And you will see that it makes some sense to know what subtype of AVNRT you have. Because some of you will say, well, why should I look at the subtype? I will always burn in the postreceptal area. That's where the slow pathway is. And whatever form, slow, 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 fast, fast, slow, I don't care. I just burn there and I will solve my problem. Well, somehow that's right, but it's not fully right, as you will see. Definitely, you should not burn in the anteroceptum anymore. That's where avian RT ablation started, before some of you were even born, maybe. But um, this was because we could map that. We thought that AVNRT was located inside a node. As you know now, it's different, and you should not burn there because you cannot solve all AVNRT, and you take a huge risk of creating AV block, of course. So we have to burn in that slow pathway area. Slow pathway, as I told you, is approaching from the coronary sinus ostium. In fact, in between the coronary sinus ostium and the tricuspid valve, we call this the postoceptal isthmus, up to the AV node. Should we approach that anatomically or should we approach it electrically? You know that people like Jackman and Esseguer described potentials, the slow pathway potentials or a more mid-septal fractionated electrogram that indicated the slow pathway area. And you may still look for those potentials, although I say, uh, or I can say that most people probably have a mixed approach. They look for electrograms, but somehow they go anatomically to that area. And I will come back to that anatomical approach. And so how do you do the approach? Again, you can read the paper where I've, I've uh, written a very practical uh, guide on how to ablate AVNRT. I always ablate during sinus rhythm, 
I do not give isopraternal because I want a stable catheter position. If you give isopraternal, the heart will move much more and you take more risks of damaging the AV node. I burn with a four millimeter tip catheter. Usually I take a 2.5 inch, sometimes a three inch curve to reach that posterosceptal isthmus. I do not use temperature control for AVNRT, just power control, because if you have temperature control and your catheter jumps away, the, 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 the power generator will adjust the power and you may have high power when you jump away and that may cause problems if you jump to the his bundle and you can inadvertently block the AV node. So control your power manually. You may still look at the temperature, of course, but control your power manually. And I start at 20 watts sometimes go up to 30, maximally go up to 40 watts. And I have a combined approach. I look for an electrogram, but I make anatomical extensions. And I start in that area between the tricuspid valve and the coronary sinus ostium. Usually it does the job there. Sometimes you have to bring it up a little bit closer to the ostium of the coronary sinus ostium. Sometimes you even have to go a little bit inside the coronary sinus ostium, just half a centimeter to do the job. And only very rarely you have to do what Hesse Aguirre did more systematically. It is going up to the mid septum above the ostium of the coronary sinus ostium. But there I think you start taking more risks. And usually you don't have to do that. If you do your ablation well, in the real postreceptal area, you're safe and you uh, usually can ablate AVNRT. So let's look at our school teacher. Here we have the catheter sitting nicely in that postreceptal area. Um, here, as you can see, also underneath the his bundle, far away from the compact AV node, this is a safe area. Very nice electrograms. If you want to see slow pathway potential, well, this is one. You rarely see it that big here. Okay, so this is a nice area. Anatomy is right, electrogram is right, we should start burning. Here we start burning, and quickly we see this development of junctional rhythm. And you're all happy when you see junctional rhythm, of course, because you know that junctional rhythm is an indication that you indeed heat the approaches to the AV node. And it has been shown that this is a sensitive, albeit a specific sign, that you might be successful. If you have no junctional rhythm, there's a slow chance you will be successful. If you have junctional rhythm, you at least know you heat the approaches to the AV node. That's where the slow pathway is, so you have a good chance of being successful. It's no guarantee, but it's a good chance. So often you will see that the junctional rhythm, in fact, is what we call low atrial rhythm. First, you get atrial outbreak in the postreceptal area, and only after a while, it turns into a real junctional rhythm where the his bundle is first. And that's because the first junctional rhythm is escaping via the postreceptal area. So you get first early A, then only his and V, and earliest A in the postreceptal area. It's a low atrial rhythm. And only when you burn that exit, then it has to escape over the fast pathway, and you first get the his bundle, and then the atrial activation in the anterior septum. So again, think that through, look at it when you do that procedure, because it's nice to see what's happening there. So you know you're burning the exit to the atrium, and also that should be a good sign of um, your burn. And the big advantage of having the junctional rhythm and escaping via the atrial, uh, the anterior septum via the fast pathway is that it tells you something about the integrity of the fast pathway, which is the physiological pathway. Of course, you know you have to look at that. Because when you would see this, this is another patient again. Here we have junctional rhythm during the burn. We have another junctional beat. What would you do when you see this during application of energy? Would you stop? Would you continue? Or would you say, well, in some cases I would stop, in other cases I would continue? You may vote. Can we have a voting slide? The voting open? I don't see anything. Technician, do we have a voting slide? Ah, uh, here we go. Okay. So when you see that, do you say, oh, stop? Everybody in my lab has a right to call stop. Even the nurses, even the technicians, even the anesthesiologists. Okay, well, most of you would stop. Some would continue, that's bold. And uh, some say it depends. Well, 
In fact, when you see junctional rhythm, oh, you have to stop because it indicates that you have no exit anymore over the fast pathway. When you were seeing what you were having here, you have a junctional beat, so you heat the slow pathway approaches, it activates the his bundle and goes to the ventricle, but it doesn't come back to the atrium anymore. This could signal damage to the fast pathway, which is the physiological conduction axis. So if you see this, this can be a precursor of AV block, and the great AV block, and that's not what you want. So that's why most of you correctly said, well, you should stop delivery of energy. But in fact, the last option would be my answer. It depends. Because here you have to know what subtype of AVNRT you're dealing with. And that's why it's important to evaluate quickly in the beginning of your ablation procedure, is this slow fast, fast slow, or slow slow? Let me explain. When you have atypical AVNRT, you see that junctional rhythm with VA block, exactly what you've seen, can be seen in 26% of the ablations, whereas you see it only in 6% of slow, fast ablations. Now, if you see it in atypical AVNRT, it's only rarely associated with anti-grade block. It occurs, but rarely. You see it not very often in slow, fast ablation, but if you see it, one out of three will also develop AV block. And this is after stopping within a few beats, right? Just seeing it and stopping it. So the message here is that if you know you have an atypical AVNRT, maybe you can expect to see this VA block, and maybe it's something you should indeed accept to get to your result. Why? Because if you have a slow slow and you burn the slow pathway, you heat it, but like the low atrial rhythm that I was talking to you before was happening in the beginning of every AVNRT ablation, if you have slow slow and only retrograde slow, the ectopy you induce there can only escape over the slow pathway. It cannot escape over the fast pathway in many of those patients. So if you burn the slow pathway, it cannot escape anymore. So during your induction of ectopy and automaticity, you also block retrograde conduction because that's what you are ablating, the exit site, which is a slow pathway in an AVRT, which is atypical. So there you have to accept that junctional rhythm with VA block to get to your outcome to a successful ablation, okay? Nevertheless, the first time you see it, you stop, and you immediately evaluate what is my anti-grade conduction doing. But if you know you have atypical AVNRT, maybe you have to bite your nails a little bit during the rest of your procedure and say, well, I will even continue when I have this VA block because I may need it in this case. If you have a typical AVNRT case, never accept, accept this junctional rhythm with block. That's always looking for trouble, okay? So I hope uh, that I made it a little bit clear. Now, a trick you can um, use to help you out is immediately as you see that, during the second burn, for instance, you tell your technician, well, as soon as we get the VA block, turn on atrial pacing at a rate which is a bit higher than the junctional rhythm you've seen so that you start capturing the atrium and you get integrate conduction and despite the junctional rhythm here which was showing VA block or junctional uh, or yeah, VA block you ha now can evaluate integrate conduction which is still intact and you can continue your burn so this is a trick you can use to give you a little bit more uh, security during the rest of your ablation. Very important. Yes. Can I ask yeah, sure. In your picture, you take uh, the slow, slow uh, uh, AVNRT in the same region. Mm -hmm. Burn that region. Don't you get AV block then? No, you will yeah, not get uh, AV I'm block because I'm these you people. You the question for the rest of the Yes. Audience. So the question is if you have slow, slow and you burn that region and you continue, will you not get AV block afterwards? No, because people with slow, slow AVNRT always also have a fast pathway antigradely. The only thing is that that fast pathway is not always conducting retrogradely. So if you have junctional rhythm and the only thing they have retrograde is a slow pathway, then the junctional rhythm will block. Okay, Some people with slow, slow, it's a good question, have also retrograde fast pathway conduction, so they will not show this behavior. That's why you only see it in 26%, but you will see it in some. Yeah. Fine.
Five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah. I have to hurry. <laughs> Good. Our female school teacher. So, first born, nice junctional rhythm. She had no junctional rhythm with block. We do incremental atrial pacing after that. Oh, very nice. Look, we go to AH 210, and then it blocks, and then we get A 110. So the fast pathway blocks, no slow pathway. It looks good, right? We have no one-to-one -one conduction anymore. This is not your final endpoint. This is one good sign, and you should always obtain absence of one-to-one -one conduction over the slow pathway as an endpoint, but you should always obtain non-inducibility. And in this lady, when you do some burst pacing, sometimes you see that with the last beat, you jump from a fast pathway to a very slowly conducting slow pathway, which gives an echo beat and starts tachycardia. So we heard the slow pathway, but we didn't eliminate the AV and RT in this lady. So you have to look for the dual uh, endpoint elimination of one-to-one -one conduction, and also non-inducibility. So as I told you, you have to extend that lesion of ablation. We went into the proximal coronary sinus with a uh, subsequent burn, and despite induction of junctional rhythm, she remained inducible, even over the anterior, also even when we went with septally, even when we went to 40 watts, even when we used an SL2 sheet, a very nice trick, take that home, to improve the contact with the septal wall there. Nice junctional rhythm, elimination of one-to-one, -one, but still inducibility. Very frustrating. You have seen that sort of procedures. And so we, we already went up to the mid-septum. So what can we do next? Well, there's a possibility to go a little bit farther into the coronary sinus. You have to reduce your output, 20 watts, but you can go about one centimeter, 1.5 centimeter. And that's what we did in this lady. And again, we induced during RF7 here inside the coronary sinus. Also, oh, we even went up to 30 watts, which I usually not do. But here you see we're inside the coronary sinus. We again induce rapid junctional rhythm. But after that, she was still inducible. So very frustrating procedure. Usually it's easy, but it's not always easy. So what should you do now? And we will not vote in sake of time. Would you go up to 50 watts? I would not do that. Do you use cool ablation? I would not do that. Do you stop here and wait for the clinical outcome? Well, if you have inducibility, you will have recurrence. Probably that's not a good option. Although you could say, I come back when the edema has resolved and maybe next time I hit it. Or you go transeptal. And that's what we did. And it's a very, very uncommon scenario. But here we went transeptal, went with an application at exactly the same site as where we burned inside the coronary sinus ostium. Again, induced very fast junctional rhythm, which slowed down. And at the end, we had no one-to-one -one and we had non-inducibility of tachycardia. So this is an exceptional case, but it shows you that in 1.6% of AVNRT ablations, as uh, also Jackman has described, you have this so-called left variant AVNRT, where you have to ablate inside the coronary sinus, sometimes even transeptally. Originally, we didn't do that in the first procedure. We always uh, told the patient, well, we can do it at the right side, we can go transeptally, but we don't know what is the risk of doing that. I, th I think that still applies. None of us knows how safe it is to burn left uh, septally. We have done it now in about nine or ten patients. Nine out of them were successful, uh, and we had no complications. But still, I'm a little bit concerned, not for the transeptal puncture. We do that very commonly. But how safe it is to burn there, because you may be very close to the compact AV node if it is residing more towards the left side of the septum, and you, you may end up with AV block. So usually we do it in a second procedure after we have discussed with the patients that possibility. And that lady here was an exception. Uh, we did it in the first procedure. One slide about cryoablation. I'm nearing the end. Um, it has been advocated by some because it allows you to have transient effect, efficacy mapping as it's called. Um, it may be safer. When you freeze, it adheres to the wall, so you may have more stability. Um, 
I must say the hype about cryo is a little bit over. I don't think so many of us still use it because we have concerns about its effectivity. Um, there's more recurrence, definitely. It's definitely less practical. It takes you more uh, time. I'm not sure whether it is really safer because the real unsafe procedures are usually due to anatomical variations. And I think cryo might have similar problems there when you want to come to a good outcome. And definitely it's much more more expensive. So I've used it uh, years ago a couple of times and uh, I've gone back to uh, radio frequency ablation and I, I feel fine with that. But if you have experience or you work in a center that does cryoablation, you can go into it. Let me in the very last slides say something about the anatomical approach. I have to go back because this should play. Um, I talked about the electrical mapping and about the anatomical um, evaluation and I must say that we are coming back to a more anatomical approach even for simple things like AV Nol Orient and Tachycardia. I hope this movie is playing. I was assured that my movies would play and otherwise the finale will go wrong here. Is it playing? Ah, uh, here we go. So this is rotational angiography, which is now available in most cat labs. It takes only five seconds. Uh, we have done a lot of work on that over the years. First, of course, for PVI, um, pulmonary vein isolation. But since we've brought down the radiation dose related to it to less than one millisievert, we are starting to use it now for simple procedures like AVNRT. And I've really learned nice things. And I will show you just three slides because you, you, you will really say this, this is nice. I hope this was the first. We have now an anatomical approach. Look here, we have the 3D. This is the tricuspid valve. This is the coronary sinus ostium. And we now tag where we think we should burn. You look, this is low at the upper third level of the coronary sinus ostium. And we burn an REO and LEO. We have special uh, mapping system developed in Leuven, which is called LARCA. And we burn anatomically guided on that region. And we usually have junctional rhythm there, and we usually solve the thing. And I must say that I've learned a lot about the anatomy. I thought after thousands of avian RT that I knew that region very well. When I look at these 3D images, I say, well, is it looking this way? This is, this is strange. Well, let's adapt our ablation procedure. And in some th instances, like on the next slide, you really have to adapt your procedure. This, for instance, is a, is a procedure where we again tag that anatomical area. But look at how this catheter has to go there. Very v bizarre approach. I would never have done this with the 3D information uh, not being available. This was only uh, possible with the 3D uh, information. And so now we really do that anatomically even more and we tell the fellow go to the dots and that's where you have to put the burn. This is for instance a lady <laughs> if the slide I'm is playing. Right. Yeah, you get your time. This is Come on. Because this is Be such a nice example, example with a, a persistent left superior vena cava, very huge ostium. Again, purely anatomical approach. The red dot is where we got the junctional rhythm. And it becomes a very, very anatomical, very straightforward procedure. So I thank you for your attention, and I thank Richard for his patience.